Hello again. Welcome to the first Wheelhouse Talk of the 2013-2014 series. We're really excited to have you guys here. Just to start off, I'm going to give a brief introduction of our first speaker, Mary Bukema. Her core values of hope, integrity, collaboration, faith in action, and sustainability are interwoven into her work at Habitat for Humanity. I'm extra excited because Habitat for Humanity is one of my personal passion projects, so I'm excited to hear a little bit more about that. Mary has served for the, over three years as the executive director of Habitat for Humanity in Kent County. Kent County Habitat for Humanity is the largest affiliated Habitat for Humanity in the state of Michigan, so that's pretty exciting as well. Mary strives to bring the meaning of home through her work, so we'll be able to explore that with her today. Her enthusiasm, dedication to learning, and creativity all impact her leadership style, and through that, she's able to empower the community around her. So please, everybody, welcome Mary Bukema. That was great. Good afternoon, everyone. OK, can you hear me? Because I haven't actually done this mic thing before. And I don't have a podium, because I don't like podiums. So um, I just want to have a conversation with you today. And so I want to start first by um, saying, that I wish that Mr. Howenstein was here so that I could thank him personally for his vision for leadership. And I think it's uh, his leadership qualities that he has demonstrated throughout his life. And this whole Howenstein Center is brilliant and one that I so appreciate and I hope to emulate. So I think you're all very fortunate to be a part of the Howenstein Center uh, Cook Leadership Academy. And I'm honored to be here. I'm, I'm thrilled to be asked to be here. and. Uh, I just want to have a conversation with you about leadership. I don't have a format really to talk to you about any one agenda or anything, but I will say that uh, core values are really important to me, and core values are important to everyone. So here we are on September 11th, and I'm always really reflective on this day. I don't know about all of you, but 12 years ago today, I know exactly what I was doing and where I was, and actually, um, the wife of one of my colleagues at the time is in the audience today, which I think is really fitting. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about that story and then talk about how stories in your life really do prepare you for your role in this community and your leadership experience. So 12 years ago, uh, I was a designer for a builder in West Michigan, high-end custom home builder. So I come from a for-profit world into non-profit. So I just want to kind of give you an explanation of what that's like. But we were in a staff meeting and we had a client call us and say, and something terrible had happened. And um, you know, right away, we turned on the television. We happened to have a television, which was really odd because we never really had a television in our office. And we were watching um, the Twin Towers and we saw the Twin Tower burning. And um, I thought to myself, this is just a terrible mistake, right? Everybody's thought, this is just a terrible mistake and we're going to figure it out, but we've got to get to the bottom of it. And, and it's going to be OK. And then while we were watching television, um, the second tower was hit. And I don't know where all of you were, but I was completely rattled by that. And um, I think what happened to me is that I realized that it was no longer a mistake and that I couldn't conceptualize how something so horrific could happen in my lifetime or in any of our lifetime. And I could not get home fast enough. I couldn't care about anything else that day. I just wanted to get home. And um, because I thought, I I'm going to be safe there, I kind of felt rattled. Like, am I going to get hurt? Um, how's my family doing? We don't live in the same town. I just wanted to connect with the people I loved. And I wanted to be, be in the place where I found my stability and my grounding. And I think what happened, too, on that day is that our core values were really shattered at least in the beginning of that day. Um, but what I think is beautiful about what happened in the healing process that it, at that event is that our core values were restored and we got to see the power that people can do when they come together for good. And so um, just kind of being reflective about the day and with respect for the lives that were lost and for those who serve, um, I just want to kind of talk to you in that framework. So home is really important to me. I, um, 
I want to tell you a little bit about Habitat because I am an ambassador for Habitat for Humanity and I'm honored to do that. That's a, a significant part of my life and a lot of my friends are here today from the Center for Community Leadership and my colleagues at Habitat and I have community friends here and students whom I've met and, and all of you. Um, I want to tell you about Habitat because it's a framework for my discussion about leadership. So I have a little video that I want to show you because I could talk for the entire hour about Habitat, but I really just re want to talk to you about leadership and coming from my experience, not having been trained or educated in leadership principles and theory and practice, and how I got to this place. So I have my own list of questions that I'm going to answer for you, and then I hope that you will ask me questions as well. And I'd really like this to be a dialogue and a conversation about leadership you can interrupt me anytime, and we can just have a conversation about my experience and what your experience might be or, or what you might say to me. I will say that when you raise your hand to ask me a question, would you please tell me who you are and kind of what you're doing right now? Because in my work every day, and what is a tradition at Habitat is that we always introduce ourselves and talk a little bit about ourselves so that we better understand who the families that we are serving who the community partners are that we're volunteering with, who our donors are, who our church members are, all of that. So if you will, just share with me who you are so I know a little bit about you and then I can share a little bit more openly about myself. So let's look at this video about Habitat. The problem is out of control. So much so that you've probably learned to ignore it. Maybe we even encourage each other to forget it. We imagine it is far away while it affects our own communities. We allow ourselves to forget about the cold, the disease, and the need. can seem overwhelming, and so poverty housing has been accepted as normal. We couldn't afford to rent a room or a, an apartment. We stayed at our uncle's um, garage. So we had only one um, room where we all slept, and we studied there, we eat there, and um, yeah, so pretty much that's our living room. In the United States, over one third of the nation suffers from some form of housing problem. Globally, the situation is even more dire, with more than one billion people living in urban slums. If the problem is not addressed, the number will double in 20 years. We had nowhere to stay, so we lived in these slum-like conditions for over four years. We had no bathroom, no running water, and no heat. A lot of people forget what human rights means to most people on Earth. But if you ask the average person uh, in America who's deprived of, uh, of opportunities, or particularly overseas, what are the main human rights, they would start off, I would like to have a right to live in a decent home. We wanted to get out of the garage space. And um, have it have a real living space. Like everybody else. The idea was and is a simple one. No handouts, no giveaways, just a little help. Volunteer labor, donated building materials, reduced or no interest loans, partnership. Since 1976, our Christian mission has served nearly 500,000 families worldwide. This is what Habitat does. They see a need and they address it. They take action. I think it's, um, it, it's a life changer. It, it is. And it's a, it's a community builder. Habitat 
doesn't just give us the house. It, it gives us the opportunity to have our own house. Um, so we, are, we have to make payments on our own every, every month. You have to be able to show that you can afford to pay a monthly mortgage and your utilities um, and still put food on the table and gas in the car. The Habitat model works because it is designed as a sustainable graduated solution. Families apply and are selected based on their overall need, as well as their ability to repay a nonprofit mortgage. Their monthly payment then returns to our revolving fund, moving on to help other families in need. I like it that sweat equity is a part of the foundational criteria that at the end of the day, all homeowners across the world can stand up and say, I helped build this house, nobody gave me the house. Yeah, so we had to do 500 hours to uh, call it our house, yeah. <laughs> Families receiving this hand up agree to work alongside and in partnership with Habitat for Humanity. Sweat equity is the investment a family makes in their future. Families spend up to and beyond $500 of sweat equity joining with volunteers from around the world to build their own housing solutions. My family was able to bond with the student volunteers that came to help us build. They really put their hearts in it. The energy and compassion they brought with them made me weep with joy. Volunteers make the difference by picking up a hammer and helping to change lives, often gaining as much or more from the experience than the families they partner with. These partnerships provide a spark for community improvement. Our mission extends beyond the walls of our houses and the results of Habitat's efforts are more than the sum of nails, paint, and wood. So a home is not just a house where you live. It's a home where you get all the energy you need in order for you to achieve in life everything that you can be. <laughs> I think in, in, a, in a generic way that um, the ability to be safe and secure and comfortable in one's home Pays, pays every benefit that, that we can imagine to one's own well-being. You take a family and you put that family into a healthy living situation, a, a healthy home, you will see improvements on the interaction between the parents and the children or the children and the children. You will see that they are better able to go to school because they're not having asthma attacks. You will preserve their intellectual function because they don't have lead poisoning. People's health gets better. The home is an epicenter um, in which people struggle to be well. Healthy, sustainable uh, behaviors that lead us to be physically well, psychically well, spiritually well, often find their origin in the home. So it is, it is the essential, unwaivable prerequisite for many aspects of our well-being. So all of these things together make a difference in how well you will perform in school, what kind of a job you'll get after you're finished with school, how well you will proceed in that job, um, but also kind of like the day-to-day, -day, you know, something about life success is how you feel today. Are you happy? Are you productive today? Well, I was able to focus um, and get um, good grades and um, without enough time to study or have the space to study, it would not have been able to, for me to graduate um, from UC Berkeley and uh, go on with the process of applying to pharmacy school. An adequate environment fundamentally changes the foundation of a family. More than shelter, Habitat's programs build stronger families, improved health, and proper places for children to study and learn. Three of us already graduated. My little sister is going to school right now at City College of San Francisco. Every 24 hours, nearly 150 homes are completed with the help of our partner families and volunteers. The needs of these families are diverse, but so is the Habitat for Humanity solution. In addition to our traditional model, Habitat's partner families are served through programs including disaster response, government relations and advocacy work, as well as neighborhood revitalization and microfinance solutions. Without Habitat, we would still be living in those horrible conditions. There are not enough words to express my thanks. Thank you so much for um, helping our family and um, a lot of our fam other family like ours to um, 
be able to um, live with our own space and um, achieve our um, dream, be able to um, reach our goals with our lives. Yeah, thank you all. The transformation begins by building a new reality and creating opportunity. With the help of donors and volunteers, Habitat for Humanity is building brighter futures, secure foundations, healthier children, and stronger families. But the work is not done, and we need your help. Please donate, advocate, or volunteer, and discover what you will build. So I'm really fortunate um, because I get to lead an organization that's a leader. And um, so I'm really blessed and obviously humbled by um, this video, which I've seen 20 times and still can't watch it without crying. So it's a powerful thing to see um, people come together to make significant change in the world. So now here we are in Kent County. How does that fit into our own community and what are we doing together? to address this need locally. And um, we're doing so many things. So those of you who have ever volunteered on a Habitat site, I want to thank you. Or who have given a financial gift, I want to thank you who have referred a family to us who uh, would partner with us. What I love about the work that we do is that we develop partnerships with families and people of all walks of life to end poverty housing. And our partner families are really partnering with us in this mission, which is the most beautiful process that I can think of. So um, I, this is just a framework for me to talk about leadership. And you know, I talked a little bit about being a designer before I came to Habitat, and I um, wanted to tell you a few of the questions that people ask me. And, and I'm never offended by any question. And, and I hope you will think about a question that you can ans ask me um, as we chat a little bit. And um, I have my own list of questions here that I wrote out because these are the questions that people ask me all the time. And so I want to answer some of those questions because it can kind of help me tell you that in the last three years or in the three and a half years since I came to Habitat, what have I done there? What is my leadership role? How do I fit in? And how am I building a culture that engages people of all walks of life to serve? So. Um, the first thing is that I just wanted to tell you a little bit about my background. I'm one of five kids. I'm, uh, I was raised on the south side of Chicago. My dad's an educator and a principal. I have an uh, awesome family. Um, I come from a family where core values are at the heart of everything we do. We're incredibly close, and uh, faith is at the core of everything that we do in my family. So that part of this story is really meaningful to me because I can live my faith and, and execute this work um, and engage people of all walks of life in that process. It's probably the most liberating experience I've ever had that I can um, be extremely inclusive in all the people that I reach out to, uh, and yet it feels right with who I am as a person. So um, when people ask me, what makes a good leader? Uh, I say, what makes a good person? Um, any of us can be leaders. We're all leaders. You're all experiencing this already. It's, uh, my first job interview was at Fuller Theological Seminary. I spent four years there uh, raising money for Fuller for the Graduate School of Psychology. And everyone who got hired at Fuller who was an ambassador for the organization had to interview with the president. And at the time, that was David Allen Hubbard. He's a really, really kind guy with really big jowls, and um, not everybody got to talk to him all the time. You know, he was kind of a guy that was out, and he was a theologian, and he was a scholar, and uh, so I had to go meet with him. And I went with my future boss, and I got to the interview, and um, we had a really nice chat. It was the day after Easter. I'll never forget it. We talked a little bit about what Easter meant to us, and, um, and then he said to me, you know, Mary, this isn't rocket science. And um, you're going to do just fine. Um, and I'll never forget that, because 
it's not rocket science. None of us has to have something in us that's different from anyone else. We just have to figure out how to work together and build on each other's strengths to carry out a mission. So I'm not talking about rocket science here. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my own experience. So when I came to Habitat, I had been a builder and designer for the last 15 years. Um, and about the time I turned 50 years old, I, I just had a hankering in my heart that I wanted to do something totally different. I wanted to give back. I wanted to be a nun when I was a kid, and I was raised Christian Reformed, so that was <laughs> never going to be the case. Because um, I had all these Catholic friends, and I loved Catholics, because they got to go to church on Saturday, and they got to play bingo. And those are the things that I just wanted to do. So um, I, I didn't become a nun, but you know that desire to serve has always stuck with me. And it's part of my core value, is service. And I think everyone on the planet wants to serve in some way. They want to serve their family or their church or their community in some way. And so what an opportunity I have got in my life to serve. And that's at the heart of what I do every day. So when I got to Habitat, my first day at Habitat, um, they said, well, we're not ready for you. We don't have a desk for you. We, we don't have any computer for you um, because we're out all doing their work, you know? So I got there and uh, figured out we have a restore. Habitat has a restore. I don't know if all of you are familiar with it. We have two restores um, where, where we sell gently used building materials and used furniture. And so went to the restore, selected my office furniture, got my office fixed up. Now, mind you, I came from a place where I, my office overlooked a golf course. It was incredibly swanky. And I came to Habitat, and I worked next to the diesel fuel trucks that were pulling into the warehouse in a room that had nothing. And I felt like I hit, hit the jackpot. So um, this is what I did when I came to Habitat. I, um, Habitat Kent County has been here 30 years. This is our 30th anniversary. There have been two leaders prior to me. Um, John Kuypers and Pam Doty Nation, whom many of you know, who developed this organization into such a beautiful organization. So I came into a place that really, I was handed a baton, and I was given an opportunity to take this organization, and a red, already awesome organization, to the next level, and how was I going to do that? No leadership experience. My first question that I'm going to answer is, how did you ever get this job? Um, Everyone asks me that. And to be honest with you, um, I had some awesome people in my life that have always encouraged me. One of my last clients at uh, BDR, my former employer, said to me one time, um, Mary, you need to go work for a nonprofit organization because you are not at all um, impressed by other people's wealth. And I thought that was a really interesting comment. But I did work with really fortunate people who had a lot of money. It really didn't matter to me because my core values were based on something completely different. So that never really impacted me. But he said, when you have a gift like that where you're not impressed or wowed by somebody else's achievements and, and wealth, you're going to be able to ask anyone in the world for money. And that's what you do in a nonprofit. So um, I kept that in the back of my head and I started to think about this is something I'd really like to do. So, I um, started gathering as many people that could mentor me as I could. And that was friends, that was my own family, or was my, um, I, I met colleagues in the community, I met people I had never known, I got on the phone and called people and started just saying, listen, I have a dream, this is what I want to do, can you help me achieve my dream? And so I got a referral to apply at Habitat, and then um, it was recognized to me that I apply for this job and then I, I got it. And then I was like, how am I going to do it? <laughs> so um, the first day I uh, got there, I thought, well, one thing I do know how to do is I know how to develop a culture. I know how to create a home. Um, it's what I've been doing most of my life. And I wanted to create a culture where people felt like they were um, being warmly welcomed there, um, that they could be themselves, that they could exercise their faith, whatever that faith was, that their innovation and ideas would be embraced, and that any form of creativity they could come up with, I would be able to identify with, and we could figure it out together. So I developed a culture there. 
And I don't know if any of you, I know many of you have been to Habitat, uh, but we have a beautiful office right on the west side of downtown, just on the southwest side in a former public school. We renovated it to lead gold. It's a beautiful, simple office space. And um, my one, well, I have a couple, couple things that I require when people come to Habitat. And that number one thing is leave your judgment at the door. Everyone is warmly welcome there, but there's no place allowed for judgment because we encounter people of all walks of life all day long. And we all come to, we all are such judgmental people, right? But um, it's not a place for habitat to really explore and to really grow. So leave your judgment at the door. Be positive because I deplore negativity. Those of you who know me, I um, always look for the positive in everything. I inherited that from my, my father who may um, sometimes be criticized for that. But I treasure that because in every situation that I'm faced with, I try to first look at what a positive outcome could be. And then you can pretty much work through anything. So I always say, what's the worst that can happen? And uh, so much good comes of that. And then flexibility. Flexibility. You have to be able to change what you do all the time. And it can't always be done the way it used to be done. My favorite thing people say to me is, but it's always been done this way before. It doesn't matter if it's been done this way before. It can be done other ways. There are so many ways to accomplish goals. So always allow yourself to be creative and express yourself and be innovative. I love that. I embrace that at Habitat. So that's a culture that, that I can talk about a little bit. The next part of my journey is developing a team. Who's going to do this work? Now, we had great people at Habitat. But really, when you take over somebody else's role, and you're looking at this organization, and it's going to be your responsibility to take it to the next level, you have to evaluate your team. And you have to make sure that the people that are on your team are doing what they do best and what they love. Because some people are working in roles that they're not maybe cut out for. Or they really would like to do something else that they'd be even better at, but they haven't had the opportunity. So to give people an opportunity to say, this is really what I'm good at. This is really what I would like to do. And um, that's, I spent a, a year really looking at the team. So I have a management team um, of eight people. And uh, Kathy Crosby was really instrumental in helping me figure this out. Kathy, thank you. She is also uh, really invest in a team approach. And um, really, I'm the figurehead of this affiliate. And I represent it as the leader. But this team really is the leader of what's happening. These people are leading all the strategy and, and um, implementation of all this work. And so you have to have the right, right people at your team. And you have to be willing to invest in good people. Um, coming from the for-profit for to non-profit, Millard Fuller, who's the founder of Habitat, had one thing that I will take with me for the rest of my life. And he said, you, in this work, you have to have a heart for service and you have to have a mind for business. You cannot go into leadership of a nonprofit without thinking it's a business. It is a business. I think you can flip that around. In any for-profit organization, you should be thinking about, you know, we should think of this as a nonprofit as well. Kind of keeps you lean, and it also keeps you servant-minded, which I think is really important, because all of us, whether it's for-profit or nonprofit, we're here to build a better life for the people that we employ and the people that we serve and in our own community. So that's something I really appreciate. So setting up a team. And I wish my whole team was here, but I do have some team members here today. And I'm really glad they're here. And they're my friends. And we do things together. And they're brilliant people. And they chose Habitat. And I couldn't be more fortunate. So um, and then you really do need to establish a vision. Where do you want to take this organization? What do you want to do? So I'm fortunate, you know, Habitat is a global organization. And Habitat Kent County is a leader. We're one of the top 2% affiliates in the country. There are 1,500 of us. And we're on the cutting edge. We've always looked at initiatives like, we can do this. This community will embrace the sustainability. We build green. We've built more than 100 lead homes in this community affordably. It's a huge contribution. It's a huge blessing 
to the resources that we've been entrusted with, as well as the preservation of our own environment. And what a great thing to contribute to a community. Um, we embrace all kinds of programs through Habitat, but the simple focus is always clear. It's always about home ownership. So now we've brought, gone into neighborhood revitalization. Our strategy is all about looking at neighborhoods and how can we impact a neighborhood? How can we buy foreclosed homes and vacant lots, put new homeowners in those lots, in those homes, give them an, an opportunity to thrive and their children an opportunity to thrive, and then contact the neighbors that are in those communities as well, and if they own their own homes, see if we might be able to provide a partnership with them that could help them improve their quality of life. And let's build those communities and those neighborhoods one by one. Because look at the investment that this city is, has had. I mean, this community has reinvested so much of its own wealth right back into the city. I think it's a beautiful part of what Grand Rapids is about. When you look at the, sur the surrounding neighborhoods around the central city, a lot of the neighborhoods people don't want to drive through or are afraid to. And that's not right. We have to have every angle of this city be a gateway to our beautiful city. And we have to build up those neighborhoods so that the people that we serve, a lower income population of people, can get to work easily, they can use the city, and they can also strengthen the only, their neighborhoods. And we can, we can move into those neighborhoods as well. So uh, one of our neighborhoods is Wealthy Heights. Wealthy Heights is along uh, wealthy, kind of near Wealthy Theater. There are, there are five streets there that we've done 10 homes on. They were all vacant homes, four vacant lots, six vacant homes. And we've revitalized that neighborhood, but we haven't done that alone. We've done that in collaboration with so many other organizations and partners. And if you get a chance to walk through those neighborhoods, it's phenomenal what's being done. And that's the vision that's been created in this community for us. And so we have a vision and a strategy and how we're going to implement it. And then the other most important thing that I'm really passionate about is measuring those, the impact that we've had on this community. That's something we haven't done very well, but I think that all together, community-wide, we're starting to address that. Uh, when you look at the Dorothy Johnson Center, we can partner with them to really start l looking at what is it that we're accomplishing together. I think the history is going to tell that this is an amazingly collaborative community that we can come together and do this work. And that's in my sweet spot. Because my favorite part of my job is building relationships. I get to be everywhere. I want to know everything that everybody's doing. Because when I think about building my own vision, in the vision for a future for Habitat, and I can think about what everybody else is doing in their work, I don't want to duplicate anything anyone else is doing. It's going to be our own thing, and it's going to be about home ownership, but it's going to build on all the other strengths that all the other organizations and community partners and investors do this work so that we can impact this community to a greater level. So it's really fun work being a leader in this community, and I highly recommend it. Um, so we get to identify uh, a need and create a vision and, uh, and a strategy to carry out our, our, our vision. So a couple other qu questions for you, and I want to make sure that I give plenty of time here to chat, so Tori will keep me on, on guard here. But uh, people ask me, are you nervous about public speaking? And I, I wanted to tell you a little story. Um, I come from a family of singers. My family sings together. I know we're not the Van Traps, but we're pretty close. <laughs> and um, so when we get together, we often will, um, like at a meal, at the end of a meal, we'll sing together. It's a really beautiful thing. It was kind of weird for my husband at first, but he's kind of <laughs> wrapped his mind around it. And, and um, so we sing together. And uh, I've always been a singer my whole life. And uh, I was a soloist when I was young, and I, I uh, was a soloist all through high school. But the more I sang solos, the more anxious I got about it. And so uh, when I was a senior in high school, I had to uh, sing a solo at my church. And I was so wound up about it and so wigged out about it that my mother gave me a Valium. And um, I had never had a Valium. <laughs> and uh, so I got to church. I felt fantastic. <laughs> and I got up, and I never used, I never used I never used lyrics or, you know, and I typically don't even use a cheat sheet when I talk because 
I just want to speak to my heart, I want to sing from my heart, I want to just, usually I know all the lyrics. I couldn't remember a single lyric to the song, so I hummed the entire thing. And um, after that, you know, I thought, well, medication is definitely not the answer in dealing with my anxiety about public speaking, but I will say that when you are um, looking at a leadership role, and really all of us are leaders no matter what we do, you really have to be able to communicate what it is you're trying to do to a group of people. And I've got a great piece of advice from a former colleague of mine at Habitat who I really admire his public speaking ability because some people just are really gifted at it. And um, he said to me, Mary, just relax a little bit about it. Um, understand it, who it is that you're speaking to and just talk to those people. So um, I just want to share that with you because public speaking can be kind of daunting, we all know, right? And um, it really is, really when you're thinking about, I'm talking to friends and advocates of the work that I do, this is really not that difficult to do. It's not rocket science. So just uh, wanted to share that with you. One question I get asked a lot is, uh, how do I find mentors? Um, Mentors are everywhere, and people want to help you, and people want to give back, and people want to be mentored. And it, you know, when I took this position at Habitat, a former client of mine who recommended, remember, that I make this change, he said, I will help you. And he mentored me through that process, and he hired a business coach for, for me out of Chicago to talk about interviewing. I hadn't interviewed for a job in 20 years, probably. Um, I had no idea what to do. I had no idea what to expect. When I came to Habitat with my resume, they laughed at me. And um, because I had no idea even how to put my resume together. So use the people in your network. Um, and it doesn't have to be a formal process. A cup of coffee with anyone, anyone in this room would provide an hour of time to share with you about anything. So I really appreciate that there's a mentorship aspect to this. Uh, this Cook Leadership Academy, it's really beautiful. And um, use the mentors, it's the greatest tool you can have. And then the other thing is that you need to be a mentor. You need to be a mentor to other people because it's really how we're gonna build things together. So don't be afraid to, to use a mentor and, and then to be a mentor. And then uh, how do I define leadership? This was a, one of the challenges that uh, I had when I was in the Leadership Grand Rapids program two years ago, and I got razzed for note cards, so I will say that I'm really glad Phil Skaggs isn't here today because he really razzed me about it. Um, but I passed out these note cards, and I had my entire, um, all my colleagues write their own definition of leadership. It really is a great thing to do. I mean, I don't know how many of you have actually written your own definition of leadership, but mine is very simple. It's probably a million other people's. Um, it's uh, empowering a team to accomplish goals. It's really a very simple thing. And that's, that's really empowering people to do what they want to do and to carry out something that they're passionate about is what really leadership for me is about. So, uh, so that's um, something I really enjoy. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about sustainability. Um, People often ask me, what keeps you up at night? Not much keeps me up at night. I just want you to know I sleep really well. I'm really fortunate. But a couple things do keep me up at night. Public speaking keeps me up at night um, sometimes. And um, sustainability. And, and sustainability in terms of when you're a leader of an organization like Habitat for Humanity, when you think about how much investment this community has made on an organization in 30 years, and where this economy in is, and where this um, community is, and how much people have to give, you have to think differently about how you're gonna sustain your organization. You cannot rely on private dollars to sustain an organization. Um, so the idea of sustaining this amazing place as a leader is really, really a, a pretty heavy responsibility and one I take really seriously. And I'm working really hard with my team to come up with creative ways to think of how, how might we generate income within our own nonprofit to help 
soften the blow on our uh, community partners and yet make us um, sustainable to the point where we could serve more families. Because our goals are, we all want to serve more people. In 30 years, Habitat has served, Habitat Kent County has served almost 400 families through home ownership. In the next two years, we've made a decision we're going to serve 200 more, more families. How are we going to do that? We have a lot of money to raise. We have a lot to do, but we, we can be creative about how we can think about what else can we do to generate income beyond our restores and beyond the mortgages that we collect to do this work. So if you have good ideas, I'm, I'm open for you to share them with me. Um, there you go, I don't need that one anymore anyway. Um, <laughs> so I, I really just want to open it up to, um, <laughs> I, don't need them. I don't need any of them. Um, I just want to really open it up for conversation. So um, would you all just have a conversation with me about leadership or my team or my colleagues, uh, my friends or any students or mentors have anything that I can maybe address for you? I would love to do that. Uh, My name is Jason. I'm a Leadership Academy fellow. I'm a full time graduate student at Grand Valley. Jason. Um, thank you. I just wanted to ask maybe you could shed some light on maybe a difficult time you've had partnering with, partnering with uh, an organization that has a similar mission. I would love to talk about that. Um, a lot of times people will ask me, how does Habitat compete with Inner City Christian Federation or Dwelling Place or Home Repair Services or any other housing organization in town? And that's really simple for me because we don't compete. We work together and we have found ways to really work together. So Habitat serves the lowest level income population of families for home ownership in the world. Inner City Christian Federation serves a slightly higher income level population and they do rentals and home ownership so we have a niche together. So we're serving a greater group of people so our organizations really support each other. Same for Dwelling Place, they're doing larger, larger housing developments. And you know not everyone is cut out for home ownership but everybody, as Jimmy Carter, my friend and mentor and hero says, everyone, it's a human right to have a decent place to live. It doesn't mean it has to be home ownership. It can be something else, but, but we need to work together to do that. So um, I always talk about we don't compete with each other. We do look at the same dollars in a lot of ways from the community, but we need to come together and talk about how are we collaborating and how can those investment dollars serve more families. So together we're starting to collaborate a lot more. So I don't look at that as a problem anymore. I look at it, that as a way to develop a better relationship with each of those organizations to really understand what it is that they're doing and to see how we might share some of the same tools. ICCF and Home Repair Services and Habitat um, all do educational programs together for the people that we serve and it's a beautiful thing. So um, we're not all asking for the same dollars on that. We're asking for this community to sponsor us together to educate families about um, what housing opportunities are in West Michigan. Is that helpful? Yeah, I'm just still wondering with the recent economic situation in the state, did that cause any kind of downfall in donorship? Or? It really did. It impacted everyone. And we have never been busier than we have in the last three years. And that is primarily because um, we did get some gov government stimulus money um, you know, through the neighborhood stabilization dollars and that came filtered through the city so we partnered with the city on that and that came at a beautiful time in our history because we still needed a lot of families to serve and it got much worse because so many people foreclosed. Uh, predatory lending was huge in this community so we had target zones on the southeast side and the west side of Grand Rapids and we were able to spend um, some of that stimulus dollars and it also gave a little bit of a break to our donor base but you know you have to maintain those relationships because when those dollars go away and we don't ever rely on government funds because you never can count on them right so um, we need to maintain those relationships during that time and that's what we're doing now we're back to just functioning on a really simple model of uh, engaging people to help us get this work done is that helpful yeah, all right good Good 
I'm definitely going to need the microphone. Um, I'm Kristen, and I am a leadership fellow and a master's of public administration student, um, emphasis in nonprofit leadership. Um, and what I would love for you to talk about, if you could, I know that you mentioned earlier in your talk how crucial um, really knowing what your core values are can be to realizing your potential as a leader. Um, and I know that as young leaders, we may not have had a chance to really define what our core values are. So we may have given it some thought, but do you have any thoughts on how we might be able to further reflect on what our core values are and how we can really define those for ourselves and how we can put those to work as leaders? Kristen, rock it out. <laughs> um, I think it's really a good idea to write your own definition of leadership and to start writing down some of your core values. I have a hundred core values, I'm going to tell you, because, um, I mean, you really, you can boil it down to, to about five, but um, it's really, who are you about? What do you really, really love? What are you passionate about? What drives you? What is it that you would do no matter what? And start there. Um, also, when you're looking at an organization, whether it's for-profit or non-profit, in terms of leadership, you have to understand what the organization's core values are because I don't know if you, any of you have ever worked in a place where you did not feel like you fit. I really think that's about your core values not lining up. Um, I've learned a lot about leadership from how not to be led, quite frankly. Um, and, and, you know, like, um, I'm not a parent, but I know what it's like to be a kid and I know what I want. Um, and so, kind of, I think it's really important to keep a journal about what it is that it's important to you in this, in this process. And what is it that you admire about other people that you really, really identify with and that you really want to see as part of who you are? Because when you are leading an organization, I think the most um, powerful leaders are really transparent about who they are. You know, Jimmy Carter, he is who he is. We all know that he's probably the greatest humanitarian that ever lived. Now, he didn't start Habitat. He's just a volunteer. But he lives his life. He lives his core values on his sleeve. And um, does that help, Kristen? Is that, I think it's really important to know who you are and what you bring to an organization. And I think that makes you a lot more credible as a, as a leader. Um, so that I am who I am here in front of you and with my friends, um, with my colleagues, with my husband with my family. Um, I know Kathy Crosby would say the same thing, and I remember that from her Athena Leadership uh, um, Award presentation. So that's a really important thing to know. You have to know yourself. Hi, Mary. Uh, I'm Sing Yi. I'm an undergraduate student at Grand Valley studying history Hi, and computer science. Um, and you said that you wanted to hear a little bit from our personal experience as well, right, and have a conversation. Um, I was actually homeless in high school after um, I left foster care. Um, and it really was someone who gave me a chance, that gave me the resources, right? So someone let me sign a lease, kind of like, like when I was less than 18. Um, but that was only like the starting point, right? So um, I quickly found out that home means having a relationship with the people that you're living with and learning what that means. And so I was wondering, it's a two-part question, if you could talk a little bit about um, how you encourage that aspect of home outside of shelter in um, Habitat for Humanity. But also, um, in my time now, as move, I'm moving kind of from house to house in college, um, work has really been my home away from home. Um, and if you could talk a little bit about, as a leader, um, what you do to encourage that home environment in your workplace. That's a fantastic <laughs> question, and I'm so incredibly proud of you. I'm so glad you're here. Congratulations. Um, wow, that's such a great question. Um, habitat families. Family, to us, is one person. I love it that we don't define what a family is at Habitat because not everyone has a family. Not everyone comes to us with a network of support. A lot of people come to us with nothing. And so um, Habitat is, becomes someone's family through this process. We become the mentor. We become the educator. We become the network of referral services that this community has because we make it our business to know what's going on so that we can advocate for every person that comes to us. So in terms of a family that comes to us, whether it's one person or eight people, 
we provide a really um, pretty supportive family network to support that person through their journey. In terms of the culture at Habitat, I always say to everyone who comes to Habitat, your family comes first. You know, what you have outside of this place really is who you bring to this place. And if you aren't developing something outside of work that you can bring as a whole person, bring your whole self to work, um, then you're really, what can you contribute? It really is so important to really have a life outside of your work that you really love and nourish and can, can build because it brings a lot healthier person to, to your place of work. And then, honestly, if you come to Habitat, you'd be like a, in a family such situation. Everybody really cares deeply for each other. Just like any organization, you know who your friends are and who you want to hang out with. And uh, we really try to embrace people. Even we think so much differently, so many of us, and we respect each other so much. We would do anything for each other. And so um, is that helpful to you? All right, great. Thank you for that question. We have time for about one more question. Thank you. My name is Lizzie Hybor. Um, I'm a Cook Leadership Fellow as well, and I'm studying international relations at Grand Valley. Uh, you mentioned earlier a little bit about one of your core values is positivity. And I'm just curious, because I know every leader goes through hard times and things don't usually go their way. Uh, how do you maintain that positivity? What kind of resources around you do you look to? Does it come internally? Is it external? If you could just kind of elaborate a little on that. Sure, you bet. Um, you know, every difficult situation that comes to me, I just let it rest for a little bit. I don't react. So I think part of that is just not being a reactionary person. I think sometimes when you react to something that's, that's um, complicated or difficult or um, is maybe what, what somebody would consider a problem, I think when you overreact or react too quickly, it tends to be a little bit negative. Quite frankly, that's my experience. So um, I like to let it rest. I like to take time and I like to talk to people about it. And I have a, a network of confidence that I really do process difficult things with so that um, together we can look at what the options are for a positive outcome, even if it's a difficult thing we have to do. Um, for example, um, maybe we have to disqualify a family. That is, to me, that is a, one of the most painful things we have to do in this process. Somebody that comes to us that through the educational component or sweat equity, we realize they're really not equipped for this awesome responsibility. You know, they're not going to be able to do this. And so we need to have that conversation. That's a very difficult conversation to have. But there is a positive outcome of, for that kind of thing when you can look at the resources that you have in this community and help that family be in a situation that is so much better suited to them. So I guess when I look at, that's why I say we look at it from a positive perspective, there is something good that can come out of everything, even if it's kind of a difficult situation. Um, I don't mean to sound Pollyanna about it, but I really do believe if you take your time and consult with a group of people that you really trust and, and you process it even with your mentor, something, something good is there that you can kind of execute in a really healthy way. And so that's kind of the way I look at things. Is that helpful? Good. Um, I think that was my last question, but can I say something else before you all leave? I want to tell you about how my day started today because I forgot. Um, and I've really enjoyed being here, so thank you for having me and really appreciate your coming. It's just been an awesome opportunity for me. But I started my day this morning at uh, a breakfast with five wounded veterans from five branches of the military. Incredibly powerful to be at a table with people young people, middle-aged people who have given their life of service to this country and have been completely permanently impacted by it. Um, and how incredibly inspiring that was on September 11th. So um, Habitat is partnering with this um, art prize event called Fashion Has Heart. And actually, um, there was an art prize exhibit last year that many of you may attended. And I would encourage you to do that again this year. Uh, the event is on Fulton Street. Fashion Has Heart is a, a nonprofit that partners with Wolverine Worldwide to design uh, a boot and to make a visual expression of someone's incredible experience of becoming wounded um, while serving. And um, 
So that, uh, that will be on display, and, and Habitat's partnering with this organization because Michael, who runs Fashion Has Heart, happens to work at Habitat. And, and he's actually going to be a wheelhouse lecturer as well, I think, kind of at the tail end. So you're going to get to hear one of my colleagues speak as well, which is how often does that happen to Habitat folks. But um, what an inspiring thing. I, I want to encourage you all to go to that uh, exhibit at some point. Um, it really is moving. It's beautiful to see uh, what a life of service can do and how it impacts a person, but how that story can impact so many other people's lives, and it really impacted mine. So I encourage you to do that. Thank you so much for having me today. I really enjoyed being here. Keeping in Hound Science Center tradition, we'd like to express our thanks with the Hound Science swag bag. Love it, thank you. <laughs> yeah, All it, kinds of loot in here. Yeah, That's tons great. of stuff. Uh, so we'd really much. like to thank you. You have a wonderful worldview that you put into action, and that, that certainly you. made a difference for me. Oh, um, so thank you for Evan, being thank here. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I wish I saw your uh, clip earlier. Oh, I well, could have used you. You might, you might want to volunteer now. on a Habitat site and <laughs> learn how to fix that. So. Yeah. Thank you all. Uh, one comment before we leave. Um, you know, there's the idea of 360 degree leadership. You lead up, you lead down, you lead with your peers. Uh, but you have to remember inward leadership. You have to recharge those leadership batteries. So I don't know about you, but I really needed to see that video and hear Mary today. So that was an excellent opportunity. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. <laughs> there we go.